Welcome to the Museum at FIT's Fashion Culture Online Series. It is our pleasure to present Fashion Metropolis Berlin. Berlin was a fashion capital in the 1920s with hundreds of thriving clothing manufacturers, most of them Jewish, before it was snuffed out by the Nazis. Author Uwe Westphal shares his history in a discussion with historian Karen Van Horn and journalist Jennifer Altman whose grandfather ran one of Berlin's fashion houses. This program is organized in partnership with the museum at Eldridge Street. Enjoy the show. Yes. I'm Jennifer Altman, and I'll be moderating this event, which is part of the fashion culture program at the museum at the Fashion Institute of Technology. This was organized in collaboration with the museum at Eldridge Street Synagogue as well. In our conversation today, we are going to take you to Europe in the 1930s. You're going to see gorgeous images of the dresses created by the top fashion houses of Berlin. And you will hear what happened during the Nazis reign to the Jewish designers who ran so many of those houses. This is a story that is not well known. And we are going to talk to the journalist who brought it to light. This story is personal for me. My grandfather, Norbert Uchenka, ran one of those Berlin fashion houses, and he was forced to turn over everything he had to the Nazis and flee the country. We will hear more about that. But first, I want to introduce you to our speakers. Uwe Westphal is a German journalist who has spent decades uncovering what happened to the Jewish fashion designers of Berlin. He found and interviewed more than 40 Holocaust survivors, and he uncovered many revealing documents in archives all over Europe. That research resulted in his book, Fashion Metropolis Berlin, 1836 to 1939, the story of the rise and destruction of the Jewish fashion industry. We're also going to speak to Karen Ben Horan. She is a fashion historian, curator, and co-author of She's Got Legs, a history of hemlines and fashion an editor of The Sweater, A History. She's going to tell us about Leah Gottlieb, a Holocaust survivor who created the iconic swimwear brand, Gotex. And we will see some beautiful images of the designer's stunning work and hear her story of surviving the Holocaust. During our discussion, we will be answering your questions. So send them to us in the YouTube comments section. So I, I wanna start here. We know so much about so many of the atrocities committed by the Nazis, but there really has not been much attention paid to how they wiped out the thriving fashion industry in Berlin. I'm gonna start by setting the scene. If we go back to the 1830s, that's when German Jews were for the first time allowed to manufacture clothing. By 1890, about 85% of Berlin fashion firms were Jewish owned. So Uva, as the 20th century dawns, what role does Berlin play in the international fashion scene? Well, Berlin fashion was a Jewish invention, as you have mentioned. It became a center of international fashion, along with, of course, Paris and Milan. Known as Berlin chic, exported worldwide and worn by stars like Marlene Dietrich and Josephine Baker. Young modern Jewish fashion designers with startup enterprises actually quickly dominated the market in Germany. As Hitler comes to power, Jewish fashion firms are flourishing. Now we're gonna watch a short film clip that you narrate, Uva, that depicts what the Nazis did to those Jewish fashion firms. Don't forget, in 1938, all of these buildings have been raided by Nazi hooligans. They have thrown out index cards, fabrics. They actually forced them to give up their business. So 2,700 companies were in this immediate neighborhood. Nearly all of them were Jewish. And with the Kristallnacht, that was the end of the Jewish Berlin fashion industry. Not a lot of the old buildings are still there, but some. After the 1820s, Jews were officially allowed to produce new garments. They invented efficient sizing systems. 
and so began Berlin's fashion industry. This building is actually the Valentin Mannheimer business office and they even did fashion shows in here. The Valentin Mannheimer coat factory was world famous, the king of coats. He was huge, he had nearly 8,000 employees. The old original gate is still here. You can see the V and the M, Valentin Mannheimer, he exported globally. The astonishing boom in the Berlin fashion trade and its emergence as a new dynamic fashion capital drew top fashion designers from Paris. As women became increasingly emancipated, hundreds of fashion magazines stimulated customers to shop at grand new department stores like Nathan Israel, Hermann Gerson and Valentine Mannheimer. Soon Berlin had around 2,700 fashion retailers and workshops, most of which were Jewish. Talk about the thousands of fashion firms in the center of Berlin. And one of them was my grandfather's. His firm, which was named Norbert Uchenka, had a staff of 120 people. He was a leading designer of women's clothing. What happened to him is what happened to so many Jewish designers when Hitler came to power. Uva, can you tell us what you discovered about his story? Yeah, the first boycott against Jewish stores in Berlin was in 1933. The Nazis posted signs in Jewish store windows calling on German women to wear dignified clothing, meaning not made by Jews. There was looting and stars of David were drawn on store windows. Eventually, the Nazis took over all fashion businesses, what was called Aryanization. Forced sale of businesses installed new owners who were sympathetic to the Nazis. The total value of properties and businesses belonging to Jewish textile and fashion firms was the equivalent of what would be today more than $1 billion. And your grandfather, Norbert, was a trendsetter with his designs, which were considered very, very modern in the 1920s. Traditional brands like Gerson or Mannheimer had difficulty following the fast turnover of new trends. But he captured the spirit of the Weimar Republic and the fashion. Freedom of expression, understanding fashion as part of the spirit of the booming art scene in Berlin. Norbert was pressured by the Nazis to sell his firm. He knew he had no chance to save his business. In 1938, he agreed to a forced sale that was 86% below the estimated value of his business. All of his assets were confiscated, including his bank accounts and everything in his apartment. What the Nazis did to him actually ended up saving my grandfather's life um, because he knew after that that he had to leave right away. So he bought tickets on the famous ship, the Normandy, and he set sail in 1938 with his wife, Lisa Lotta, who was pregnant with my mother, Gloria. Uva, can you talk about what happened to his career after he came to New York City? Well, it has to be said uh, from our today point of view and know what actually happened in history after 38, 39, that he was really, really lucky to get out and he had the money to get uh, onto uh, a steamship. So at Ellis Island, his last name, that was the first thing they did, was changed from Yuchenka to J, J-A-Y. And then he rekindled his success because he was this enormously talented fashion designer the designer at 498 7th Avenue. An article in the New York Times called his designs a renaissance of fashion. Sadly, he died of cancer in 1954, so he never got a chance to meet you, Jennifer. Karen, I want to bring you in here. Uh, can you talk about what was happening at this time in the garment industry in New York? Yeah, the war is definitely a turning point for the fashion industry in terms of style, at least, because 
Um, it looks, to, until that time, it looks to Europe for inspiration, especially Paris. Um, and so when those fashion capitals are shut down during the war, um, it really gives space, it really creates room for American designers to kind of find their own style and their own statements. And the garment industry in New York, really, that's the time when it started, starts to emerge as a fashion capital and um, really kind of, you know, becomes this global success. And of course, Jewish immigrants are a big part of this industry in New York, dating back to the 19th century. So at kind of the end of the 19th century, we have a lot of Jewish immigrants coming, especially from Eastern Europe. And, um, and because a lot of them are, were in the needle trade back home, it's really natural and easy for them to um, integrate into this new ready to wear industry. Um, and some of, a lot of them are low paid workers, uh, but some of them own factories. And then if you, you know, when Jewish families are fleeing uh, Europe again in the 1930s, it's very natural to them when they come to New York to then integrate, they already have a community um, in the garment industry. So um, a lot of them, um, especially in New York, uh, go and work and, and are part of this uh, new American success. You, Karen, have unearthed the story of another Holocaust survivor, and she was able to find success after the war in fashion. You are the co-creator of a documentary film about her. It's called Mrs. G. It tells the story of Leah Gottlieb, who created the swimwear line Gotex. We're now going to watch a four-minute clip from the film, and we're going to see some examples of her fabulous swimwear. The first speaker in the film talks about how Leah Gottlieb's designs were inspired by her experience living under the Nazis. Then we see Leah Gottlieb, who died in 2012, and she's talking about her life in Hungary in a testimonial that she gave to Yad Vashem. And her daughter is shown hearing the testimonial just recently for the first time.
Hannah Gottlieb and her husband, they, they come to Israel from Hungary in 1949. Uh, they have two small girls and they also have Leah's elderly mother with them. And um, back home, Armin's family owned raincoat factories um, where Leah actually works as a secretary. She's not a designer there. Um, she was not involved in the design. Um, and when they come to Israel, they have almost nothing other than the clothes on their back. Um, and they borrow a sewing machine and they start by making those actually really beautiful um, organza bibs for children, for babies. And um, they make a little bit of money and with that money they buy their own sewing machines and um, they buy some fabric and slowly they start restart the raincoat uh, business. And within a few years, they have um, a raincoat factory in Tel Aviv. Um, but, you know, if you've ever been to Israel, you know, it's it doesn't rain much in Israel. Um, and so Leah says that when they used to make raincoats, they would look at the sky and pray for rain. And that's how they decided to make bathing suits. Mm -hmm. um, so there was plenty of sunshine and um, they revamp, they kind of convert the factory into a bathing suit factory. And that's sort of like how it begins for them. And what was groundbreaking really about the Gotex line of bathing suits? Almost everything really. Um, and first of all, it's really crucial to the understanding of her success is that her greatest innovation was that she built a whole line around the bathing suits. She really created this niche that didn't exist before her. Um, and, you know, no other fashion brand um, centered its designs around beach wear and no other bathing suit manufacturers really had this, the kind of style um, and the kind of quality that she had. And, she saw herself um, really as on the same level and as part of other leading fashion houses like Versace and you know Saint Laurent at the time. And it's reflected in her aesthetic. So um, it, she takes inspiration from art um, and also you know, the level of the craftsmanship and the quality and the attention to detail. So, you know, just to give one example, um, she, the Gotex was known for their printed textiles and she would use sometimes 24 different shades of colors for a print, which her competitors would use maybe up to eight colors. So, and on top of that, she would add embroideries and really interesting uh, surface treatments like uh, lycra that looks like it's wet even if it's not. So all of that really sets her apart um, and create this really rich and vibrant line. Thank you. Um, all right, I wanna go back to talk about Germany now again. Um, by 1939, nearly all of the Jewish fashion firms that had existed in Berlin uh, are taken over by the Nazis. Most of the Jewish owners, the seamstresses, the tailors, uh, they are all sent to labor camps and concentration camps. I, I realized that actually rather late in my research that a significant amount of clothing production was done in forced labor camps. Uh, and one, as everybody knows, uh, of these labor camps and death camps was Auschwitz. Tailors there were forced to make clothes for Nazis. And Berlin designers, this is particularly nasty, the story, Berlin designers, fashion designers, ordered prototypes of designs from slave labor camps. And Theresien Start Lodge and also from Auschwitz. And the clothing was made there. German fashion produced in roughly 18 forced labor camps. And Hugo Boss was known as the Führer's Tailor. The company apologized in 2011 for using workers from forced labor camps. That happened, but most of the firms, they actually have been involved. They had a fantastic post-war career and they never actually mentioned it. 
And this story was buried for so many years, like so many stories of the Holocaust. Uva, you started researching this back in 1984. Um, you placed ads in newspapers. You asked in those ads for survivor stories. You were not Jewish yourself, and yet you couldn't let go of the story. Uh, tell us how you uh, were harassed after your first book came out on this subject and how your work was able to get Jewish families restitution from the German government. Well, some in the German fashion industry were very, very angry uh, that I was doing my research. And that became very clear after I realized, probably a little bit naive at the beginning, that uh, when I got many phone calls in the middle of the night and uh, threatening content, um, that I thought this is just one person who actually is behaving really badly. No, that wasn't the case. There were actually many more calls. And I had to move six times while I lived in Berlin. And ultimately, I left Germany and moved to London. And my research has been used there by lawyers in Germany and in England as well to get restitution payments because I was the first one who actually published the names of those that have confiscated Jewish properties and Jewish accounts, like it was in the case of Norbert Yurchenka, your granddad, Jennifer. And so they were lucky because in the 80s you could actually still apply for restitution. And several dozen of Jewish families, including many who had actually lost everything, they got lucky and they got restituted. And uh, how did you help get a memorial erected in Berlin that remembers what happened to these Jewish designers? Well, how research, my research actually led to the memorial being created that was uh, quite in the beginning uh, an Im impossible thing to imagine. But, you know, once you start actually talking to those responsible in the city council and all that, and uh, that uh, somehow make things possible. The Hausfolk Timeplatz, which is right in the center of Berlin, of the United Berlin after 1990, um, that was my aim to put up the memorial there because that was the fashion center. And this memorial has got two parts. One, the steps leading down to the underground or subway train station. And there are 19 names of businesses that were actually destroyed, etched into the stairs. So when you go up the stairs or down, you have to look at these names. And there's also a triangle of three outward facing dressing room mirrors. Why mirrors? Pretty clear, were chosen. It actually represented the fashion room also of the 1920s and even today. It was a reminder for many German fashion designers who don't know the rule and what actually happened to the Jews in the 1930s and what actually happened to the once glorious fashion industry in the city. And it was a way for all of us, one day when we can actually travel again, we hope, to go to Berlin and visit the Marcus and pay our respects. Thank you, Uva, for, for helping all of us pay homage to those we lost and uh, to learn about a fascinating and almost forgotten chapter in fashion history. Yeah. Uh, all of you can read more about this in Uva's book, Fashion Metropolis. And Karen's documentary, Mrs. G, is showing in film festivals around the world. To get updates on screenings, follow Karen on Instagram at Karen Ben Horan. I want to again thank our sponsors, the Museum at the Fashion Institute of Technology's Fashion Culture Program and the Museum at Eldridge Street Synagogue. And thank you to our audience for joining us. This program will remain on YouTube at this link if you would like to view it again or share it. Thanks so much. Good night.